If you're like me, I'm pretty sick of big budget horror movies as I'm usually overcome with waves of disappointment, especially lately when I leave the theater. That's why I like to take a look at independent horror. There's just a little bit more love of the genre, a little bit more passion, and a lot of risks that you just don't see in the mainstream offerings. We've got five indie horror films on tap today, so let's start binging. Welcome back to M.L. Miller Frights. I'm M.L. Miller. Before we begin, please do me a favor and punch that like button down below. Share this video with all of your social media addicted pals. Click subscribe to this channel and ring that bell for notifications. Low Budget Binge is where we venture down the path less traveled and look at low budget, no budget, and sometimes international films that never get that top billing you see with the usual Hollywood fare. I'll indicate in the review down below where you can find these films along with their trailers. Here we go. A few weeks ago, I reviewed Underground, a found footage film about a group of women throwing a bachelorette party and ending up lost in a series of tunnels after they drunkenly get thrown out of a cab. While it has some issues, this was a harmless and fun little found footager, and it's now going to be released in the UK on demand and digital download. So if you're across the pond, you can now check out Underground. Skeletons in the Closet is new streaming on Shudder. It's directed by Asif Akbar and written by Al Bravo, Joshua A. Cohen, and Terrence Howard. Skeletons in the Closet starts out like a good old country song. Mark, played by Terrence Howard, loses his job on the day he was just about to ask for a raise. Not only does his daughter Jenny, played by Appy Pratt, find her pet goldfish dead in the tank, but she also finds out that the cancer she was in remission for is back and much more aggressive. With all of this going on, Mark's wife Valentina, played by Valerie M. Ortiz, believes her family is cursed and starts seeing visions of a La Llorona-style ghost lingering around her daughter. Mark's ex-con brother, Andres, played by Cuba Gooding Jr., believes he can help, but only gets Mark in debt to a mob boss. With nowhere else to go, Mark and Valentina visit a medium, played by Sally Kirkland, and a mystic, played by Udo Kier, and they're given a terrible ultimatum. For Jenny to be healed, one of the parents must give their life. Hey, you don't need to tell me. I know it's hard out there for a pimp, which is most likely the reason Terrence Howard did this movie. And while this cast sports numerous Oscar winners and nominees, that doesn't help it from being the cinematic equivalent of buttered toast. While the drama is sold by the actors involved, filmmaker Asif Akbar doesn't really know how to bring forth the scares or make any of it matter. The uninspired script ticks all of the boxes in terms of a La Llorona tale, but lacks the teeth to do anything we haven't seen multiple times before. The film is good at setting up some pretty high stakes, and with the familiar faces, it should have been easy for me to be invested in the cast's plight. But as the script meanders between being a mob story, a family drama, and a supernatural shocker, I simply had a tough time caring about any of it. Instead, I found myself wondering how far these once mighty names in Hollywood have fallen to make a movie this tepid. I mean, look at this cast. Terrence Howard has been and will always be cooler than the other side of the pillow. And even in this stinker, he's still smooth, but he can't save the film. While Cuba Gooding Jr. has seen better days, he seems to be aging into quite the character actor, despite the fact that I guess he was cancelled a while back. But who really cares about that anymore? It's always awesome to see Udo Kier, but aside from just walking around speaking ominously and carrying a big snake, he really doesn't do much for the film. Character after Clifton Powell has a meteor role as a priest and friend of the family, and Sally Kirkland shows up as a medium, and, well, it's good to see the elder actress get some work. But the true lead of the film is Valerie M. Ortiz, as the story sort of revolves around her past and present role of mother to little Jenny. Unfortunately, Ortiz has only a few go-to looks, static, slight smile, and wide-eyed shock. If anything, it's kind of sad seeing all of this talent in such a lame-ass movie. 
Skeletons in the Closet is a dud. It's just a shame seeing all of this talent with such a cliched script, bland direction, bad CGI ghosts, and cliched ghost stories. Here's hoping the entire cast gets bigger and better opportunities and that the check they received for this film was worth it. It's definitely not worth your time. There is a Monster is new on-demand and digital download from Gravitas Ventures. It's directed and written by Mike Taylor. A photographer, Jack, played by Joey Collins, suddenly feels as if he is being haunted by a strange entity. As the entity becomes more prevalent, Jack's body begins to fail him, just as his life, which has been quite fractured, is beginning to come together. Jack's estranged wife Carol, played by Aina O'Rourke, and best friend David, played by Marcellus Bassman Shepard, notice these changes, but feel powerless when doctors, psychiatrists, and psychologists fail to understand what's going on. There is a Monster is less of a narrative story and more of an example of how a person can go from completely normal to succumbing to a debilitating disease. The metaphor of the monster, lurking in the periphery and then becoming more prevalent and more harmful to Jack, seems to be a personal take for all of the people involved. So I don't want to be too hard on the film. That said, There is a Monster has a lot of technical problems that got in the way of me enjoying it. The acting is okay at times, Lead Joey Collins is by far the strongest actor of the bunch, as the story focuses on his decline. This is a deeply personal story. While Collins has some thespian hiccups at selling some of the lines, he does a decent job carrying the movie. The rest of the cast are okay at offering up a television commercial type of delivery in their performances. The film also has very rudimentary effects, as the shadow monster is pretty much a guy popping his head out or lingering in the background in a black bodysuit. Occasionally, rudimentary special effects are placed upon the suit to make it seem unearthly. That's about it. Everything else is all up to Collins to perform how the monster is affecting him. On top of that, the directing is quite flat, with some very rough scene transitions consisting of jarring fades in and out, and the music accompaniment really doesn't match the dire tone of the film. The story itself lacks the typical conflict resolution sort of narrative style. A normal horror movie presents normal life, then has the monster challenge that stability, and then the protagonist finds a way to beat that challenge. Because there is a monster tries to give an accurate story of a debilitating disease, the fact that this monster appears when everything seems to be going well for Jack seems unfair. And I know life is unfair. Fiction isn't, though. The audience deserves some kind of resolution. While you don't want to have Jack magically cured, maybe he can find some solace when he finds out what the disease he is suffering from is and that he isn't crazy after all. There is a Monster doesn't offer any type of resolution like that, which left me feeling pretty unsatisfied by the end. The end blurb gives a website to contact to help support ALS or amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, And I am fortunate enough to not have this devastating disease affect anyone I know. But I do know how hard an illness is of this type and how it can affect a family and the person suffering from it. There's a Monster Serves as a well-intended film that gives an up-close and personal take on how one might feel as a debilitating illness, like ALS, can come from nowhere and utterly upend one's life. I can't recommend this as a good movie as it fails narratively, but it does take one through the emotions, confusion, sadness, and despair that accompany this type of disease in a convincing and heartbreaking manner. In that sense, it's a success at putting the viewer in the shoes of the afflicted. And that's about it. Midnight Peep Show is new on-demand and digital download from Dark Star Pictures. It's directed by Andy Edwards, Ariel Anthony Hales, Ludovica Masu Mechi, and Jake West. It's written by Andy Edwards, Ariel Anthony Hales, and Jake West. Just in time for Valentine's Day, Midnight Peep Show highlights the kinkier side of horror with an anthology focused on sexual deviance from some very twisted filmmakers. Reminiscent of the anthology Little Deaths from nearly a decade ago, an anthology definitely worth looking up, Midnight Peep Show is a sick and twisted little affair dealing with all kinds of stuff that is not for those with sensitive dispositions. The wraparound concerns a down-and-out businessman who stumbles into a seedy part of town and finds a business called The Midnight Peep Show. Kind of like the name of this movie. 
This guy pays for a gander at one of the booths, and it turns out each booth babe has a devious story to tell, making up the three stories of Midnight Peep Show. Ludovica Masumichi has only directed a few short films, but the filmmaker does a decent job with this story interlacing the three tales together and making everything look and feel consistent like any good wraparound segment should. Ariel Anthony Hales directed Werewolf Santa and They're Outside and handles the first segment called Personal Space, which deals with a cuckold situation that is bound to make some squirm as it really doesn't hold back in the humiliation. This sordid affair has a surprise or two, but really is just a run-of-the-mill situation that you've seen play out if you've happened to find yourself on some popular porn sites. Or at least, that's what I hear. F. Mary Kill is from the director of Punch and the upcoming Cinderella's Revenge, Andy Edwards, and while it repeats the uncomfortability of the cuckold situation, it does so in a much more sort of light-hearted way as a woman finds herself collared and strapped in a room with three former suitors, with whom she has to decide which one to F, marry, or kill. This segment is a saw riff where an unseen voice guides the woman through the rules of the game. By the way, that unseen voice is Zach Galligan from Gremlins, though I didn't really recognize his voice. I found F. Mary Kill to be just okay as well, though it seemed to have less of a perverted tone and more of a comical one as all three of the former suitors, of course, are not too happy to see each other at the mercy of this woman's preferences. The saving grace of Midnight Peep Show is Black Rabbit by Jake West, who is responsible for such great indie films as Razorblade Smile, Evil Aliens, Doghouse, and one of the sequels to Pumpkinhead, Ashes to Ashes. West tells an expansive little story in a very short time. This one deals with some really complex issues in terms of intimacy and how the spark of one's marriage fades after time. Sarah Diamond stars as a dissatisfied housewife who finds that when her husband pays for sex, it excites her. But when her husband refuses to give in to her kink after he's done it a couple of times, she seeks thrills elsewhere, leading her down a very demented rabbit hole of prostitution, S&M, and finally to a dark web snuff room. This could have been made into a feature-length film as I was riveted to the plot from beginning to end. The monster known as Black Rabbit is horrifying, and while I definitely got some hostile and Serbian film vibes, this short keeps its dignity intact by saving the gratuitous violence to the very, very end. And whoa, what an ending. I would recommend Midnight Peep Show for that final segment alone. The first two serve as decent lead-ins to the main course, but it's Jake West's segment that steals the show. It's perverted stuff, but it's also good, mature, and twisted horror that is a nice detour from the safe horror that permeates the genre these days. All in all, if you don't have any issue with having your boundaries pushed, Midnight Peep Show exists to kink up your horror real nice-like. Cheryl is available on demand and digital download from b and Studios. It's directed and written by Justin Best. Cheryl, played by Anthea Neary Best, thought things were going okay. She had a boyfriend named Ted, played by Sean Sharma, and a job writing at a beauty website. But her boss berates her every day, and Ted is a serial killer who drags Cheryl along to help out, which she does wholeheartedly. When Ted breaks up with Cheryl after a home invasion gone wrong, Cheryl snaps a little. She comes up with an idea for her blog focusing on making the perfect face from perfect parts from perfect people. Not only does she write about this, but Cheryl also decides to seek out these perfect people and steal their perfect parts. And before you can say Lady Leatherface, she starts sewing the parts together to make a skin mask. Now, as luck would have it, Cheryl meets the perfect guy, played by Christopher Sedania, but wouldn't you know it, he turns out to be the detective investigating the murders Cheryl is committing. Wackiness ensues. Cheryl is an offbeat horror comedy, heavy on the gore and sitcom hijinks. Yes, the silly coincidences and off-the-wall antics of the cast do make it feel like occasionally there should be a laugh track attached to it, and it should air in the half-hour slot after Mad About You, but hiding under the goofy surface is a real tragedy that I couldn't help but get invested in. 
The unbelievable moments, like how Cheryl is able to simply walk in and out of these murder scenes covered in blood, and how Cheryl seems to miss out numerous times on discovering what her new boyfriend does for a living, almost does the main themes a disservice. It helps that Althea Neary Best, who plays Cheryl, has an extremely strong sense of comic timing. So I was willing to overlook the sillier moments of this film simply for that. The main theme of Cheryl is society's obsession with beauty, specifically one very strange but somewhat typical young woman and the pressures that woman puts upon herself to be absolutely perfect. The irony of Cheryl is that Althea Neri Best is a stunningly beautiful woman, which only highlights how damaged she is by the lengths she goes to achieve perfection. Cheryl is a powerful tragedy, and thankfully, the film gets the goofy stuff out of the way in the first half, so it can focus on this very heartbreaking subject matter as Cheryl continues to slide into complete insanity. Those looking for a quirky and safe little horror film are definitely going to get a shock from where this story goes. Me, I loved how dark Cheryl got. While I think it's tonally off from the beginning, it finally hits its stride in the latter half, and I was wrapped up in Cheryl's fate completely by the end. If Cheryl does anything, it proves that, though she is an unconventional leading actress, Althea Neary Best is a powerhouse performer. She's drop-dead gorgeous. Sure, I have to say, seeing her in the various revealing outfits she sports in the film was... very nice. But aside from all that, she delivers comedy and tragedy with ease. Cheryl tackles some ugly truths about insecurities many women suffer from in this oblivious day and age we find ourselves living in. These truths are going to fall on deaf ears for most, but if you have even a bit of insight, Cheryl is a movie that might actually make you look at yourself in a new and positive light. That's something I wasn't expecting from a movie where the lead actress is doused in blood in every other scene, but that's what I got from it. Cheryl is offbeat and over-the-top and body gory fun, but also packs a message coming from a very talented up-and-coming actress that overflows with wisdom you might learn a little from. Finally, we have Monolith, which is new in select theaters and on demand from WellGo USA. It's directed by Matt Vesely and written by Lucy Campbell. Evil Dead Rises Lily Sullivan plays a disgraced journalist who now runs a conspiracy blog. When she receives a strange anonymous email concerning a vast mystery, she tracks down the series of unexplainable phenomena concerning solid black bricks showing up containing strange codes within their structure. As she digs deeper, more strangeness occurs as she seemingly manifests a brick of her own through thought alone and uncovers deep dark secrets from her own past. Monolith is not going to be for everyone, for the most part, it centers on one actor in a room talking with various people over the phone and online. In many ways, it reminded me of Pontypool. So that's a good way to gauge whether you might be interested in this or not. Most likely, they filmed Monolith during the pandemic. While it is professionally made in every way, Monolith is a shining example of less is more, maintaining a solid and transfixing story on a very low budget. Some may find it hard to follow the continuous switching from one conversation to the next as Sullivan's character desperately gets pulled into this conspiracy and frantically investigates to find the truth that becomes more personal the longer she looks into it. But Lucy Campbell's script peppers in revelations and more mysteries on top of one another, and this film had me the entire way through. The black brick is quite the metaphor, as it could represent almost any kind of negative thing that occurs in one's life come back to haunt them from the past. It basically is Sullivan's dark past made form, and once it hits personally, one can argue that this involves any dark secret one has kept buried and unaddressed. Monolith's story keeps the true meaning under wraps, allowing the viewer to hypothesize as to what exactly it's all about. Is it a vast government conspiracy? an alien invasion, or simply a personal nightmare come to life. Those looking for definite answers are going to be disappointed, but those who allow a little wiggle room for interpretation might enjoy how vast this subject matter can be canvassed. While answers are not certain in Monolith, the fact that Lily Sullivan is one hell of an actress certainly is. She was kind of an overshadowed by all of the blood and spectacle in Evil Dead Rise, but here it's simply her, raw, full of passion and emotion, attempting to uncover a mystery that gets more compelling the longer it remains unanswered. 
Director Matt Vesely should also be complimented greatly for making this movie look and feel interesting, though it only moves outside of the house towards the end of the movie. The rest of the time, you're stuck in one room with the lead actress. And this is still a vibrant film, despite its closed confines. Monolith has one hell of a mystery, and while the answers are left up to you, the performances, the struggle, and the absolute horror of secrets manifested are apparent from beginning to end. This is one hell of a quiet, yet pervasive shocker that shouldn't be missed. Yeah. 